surprised at how successful Brokeback Mountain was too. I mean, that was a film that must have been um, difficult to finance, I imagine, with that subject. Uh, it's quite opposite of what you imagine. Um, years ago, James Chen is my collaborator, um, who wrote my script and produced my films, <coughs> sell my movies. Uh, show me the material, I got tears in my eyes when I read a short story. But I don't imagine anybody with a right mind would give over seven million to make the movie. And it's, it's written a lot more expensive than that. It's just the, the whole thing, commercial, it just it doesn't make sense. So I put it aside, I went, went ahead to do the Hulk. After the Hulk, the short film still in my head. Just, I mean, the, the short story refused to leave my mind. Um, I was wrecked after Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and The Hulk. I was in the depression uh, at home. I figured I have to make a movie, otherwise I go crazy. <laughs> but something won't kill me. So I thought of Brokeback Mountain, a movie probably nobody will notice. Expect it to be like strictly our house, small release, nobody pay attention. In fact, the finance part was the easy part. The making was sheer pleasure. You just feel the, the project was blessed. It was happy and love throughout the whole shoot. Because I was exhausted, I made the simple, I shot it like the way I shot pushing hands. Just make the days, uh, focus on actors, just tell the story, lots of love. When it hit, when it hits the shopping mall, I start to get worried. It's pretty scary. <laughs> uh, I, I just did uh, Gay Cowboys in America. <laughs> <laughs> They're gonna lynch me or something. <laughs> um, but that's a wonderful experience. I think because I, probably because I suspect, because I was exhausted, I sort of earned that relaxation of doing very little to the movie, I think, the audience really pick up the modesty. And this is very sincere, uh, probably just what that movie needs. We must talk about taking Woodstock in a moment, but I must ask you, working with Heath Ledger, because I mean, we're here in Australia, and Heath meant a lot to people here. Um, what was he like to work with? He's a nervous guy. Nervous? Um, hyper. <laughs> um, the first time I met him, I remember he was, he was kind of nervous very serious person, needs a lot of attention. I probably didn't give him uh, as much as he wanted, but um, the bottom line is that it's very hard to take him not with us, because things changed in life. It's so unpredictable. Um, it's a terrible, disturbing feeling. What I like to think is that somehow the two of us create that character and it's tomorrow in Brokeback Mountain, that's not gonna fade away. He's a very serious actor. I think for two months, over two months, while he's shooting, not only he bite his lip, he clean his fist. So like this, uh, very intense. You know, it could be like this, just like this always. This thing grabs hold of us in the wrong place, and we're dead. The boy sure found a way to make the time pass up there. You don't go up there to fish. You don't know nothing about it. You mentioned earlier, Eng, that you, you, um, you, it, the, the ice storm, uh, you had to recreate a, a sort of microcosm of America in 1973. And with your new film, which we're about to see, Taking Woodstock, you create a, a sort of microcosm in 1969. Um, can you talk a little bit about Taking Woodstock and, and uh, uh, what your what your because this is a comedy, which is something you haven't. I mean, the early films were sort of comedies, but this is coming much more. Much, yeah. yeah. Well, I thought these two are company films. Uh, actually, I, I I did this precisely because of the reason I've done the ice storm. When this writer was promoting his book right behind me in a television show. Um, while they were resetting the table after I'd done my thing. He, he gave me a one, two minutes pitch. Usually I hate that, I hate people do that to me. 
uh, but I actually read his book because when he mentioned Woodstock, I remember when I did the Ice Storm, I thought I was doing the hangover of uh, Woodstock. Mm. That's how I have in mind. My theory is that when you do a period piece, you have to study five years ahead and see what, how it gets there. So my theory is five years. So my target is starting from Woodstock and see how it becomes the ice storm. If someday I meet some good material in 1964, I might do it because it leads to uh, taking Woodstock. I think they're very related. Uh, when you look at history at like a period, you have to see what derived there. And then you know, the benefit of doing period piece is that you have witnessed the consequence. Uh, like right now, what's going to happen? I don't know. I, I don't really want to do a, temp a contemporary piece. But the beauty of the period piece, you see the whole thing, the whole development. The word is getting out that maybe we'll have a few more guests than we originally thought. The New York State Thruway has been backed up all the way from the George Washington Bridge. It's basically a parking lot. Police are planning the first ever emergency closing of the entire thruway. What? You know what those hippies are going to do to our town? We're setting this thing down! Now you made a, a, a deliberate um, decision not to include the concert itself. Because th th this is a film about around the concert. I think that's Woodstock. I sort of take it from the book, because he never actually get there. Each time he had to go there, something stopped him. Um, and that's a real life story. But to me, not only because when it happened, I was really outside of it, I was in Taiwan being influenced. But I think, you know, what they say about, if you remember what's happening in Woodstock, you're not there. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the Woodstock. It's a utopia, it's, it's, it's a, becomes very glorified and abstract, abstract and idea. To me, it should be treated like the center of the universe, where peace and music is. Um, if you see that stage, it should be under certain uh, influence, like acid. <laughs> that's, I think that's how it should be seen. Um, Woodstock is so tremendous. Unless you're the, the camera crew from the, the famous documentary, unless you're in the first 20 roles. Most people witness the, the concert pretty much like that. They're outside, they sort of hear it, the, the booming sound, and they're with their friends under certain uh, influences, doing naughty things and thinking they're going to save the world. Yes. Um, I, I'm glad that there's a, such a small family drama just next to it. From it, you can take Woodstock to heart. Uh, by the way, that's what the, uh, the author explained to me why he named the book that, Taking Woodstock to Heart. Uh, I think that's the best way to show Woodstock. If you put, if I put a big wig over a woman and play Janis Joplin on stage, to me that's not quite Woodstock. Uh, not the essence. So how closely did you work with the author of the book, Taking Woodstock? But as far away as possible. <laughs> <laughs> That's a rule. <laughs> See you in the premiere. <laughs> I, I, I did politely invite him to the opening ceremony. And, and a few weeks back, uh, I, I did invite him back to New York. He was leaving New York, not leaving Florida, to ask him details, like what do your ma mother wear, and that sort of thing, uh, details. My art department spent a lot of time in some of the details, but uh, as a rule, it's, it's better stay away from <laughs> them. What should I do? Rally your troops. Do I have troops? Got your mom, don't you? She's a battalion. You need help. What kind of help? Oh my God. It's starting. Go see this thing. See what the center of the universe looks like. It's beautiful. It's fate. Right there at the top of that hill. 